Good morning. This is Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona Gila County Cooperative Extension. We are here for my Garden and Country Extension webinar series. And at this time, we are presenting and hosting Pace and Community Gardens um, garden classes. We've got Dan McEwen with us again. We are talking about soil planting and nurturing your garden. A little bit about these webinars for anybody who's new with us here. Um, it's a weekly Zoom webinar, 60 minutes or less, Thursdays at 11 in Arizona. Um, no registration required. You just got to get that link and, and join us. Um, right now, from February 11 to April 15, I am hosting the spring gardening classes for the Payson Community Garden in Northern Gila County, Arizona. And the recordings are posted here at the Arizona, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. And we are up to date at present. Um, and so if you want the quickest way to be able to see these videos after we get them done, usually we look to get them up the next week, if, if not even the next day, um, that's where you'll find it. So just I can slip that into the chat box a little bit later. Here's our agenda for today. Um, we have about a 10 minute lag time, um, login and lag. So thank you for all of you who joined us early. Um, my name is Chris Jones, I'm your moderator. Our topic today is soil planting and nurturing your garden with Dan McEwen. We've got about a 30 minute video that we're going to present. And after that, we'll have a little chat discussion, chat box discussion with Dan. So put your questions into the chat box and Q&A as we go along. And then we'll jump into that and answer all those questions. Oops, did not get Teresa's name off of this, kind of I write things and just miss it. Did get a good picture of you, Dan. <laughs> Was that a good day out in the field there? That's a pretty good day, yeah, harvest day. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so um, we're gonna jump in here. I did get a question that I got started here. Paul wants to know, does the Payson Community Garden have any public events this month or any open event in April? Uh, is that question for me? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and answer that right now and then we'll jump on in. Uh, well, <laughs> I was just going to say I'm, I'm actually not on the staff, so I can't officially represent them. But I believe we um, they are going to have um, the public welcome this coming Saturday. The garden is open on Saturdays in March. And I believe this Saturday, the hours are 11 to 2. And I believe they're welcoming the public to go out and take a look at the garden. There might even be some refreshments, I don't know. Uh, but uh, people are welcome to come out there and check it out and see what's available. And that is this Saturday? This Saturday. All right, well, I think the weather's still supposed to be behaving on Saturday, so a good day to get out. Okay, so um, thanks for all the work you guys have been doing putting together these presentations. I'm going to bring it up at this time. Let's make sure I've got my share sound. I'll share that. Can you see that okay for me, Dan? Yep, yeah. looks good. All right, I'm gonna hit um, play and here we go. I'm one of the gardeners here at the Payson Community Garden in beautiful Payson, Arizona. And I'm standing in front of one of my garden plots, which is one of probably 160 or so that we have in the garden. Uh, this is going to be my, I think, my fifth season of planting here in the garden. Over the last four seasons, I started out knowing absolutely nothing about vegetable gardening. I've learned quite a bit by trial and error and by learning through successes and failures and so on. There are lots of other gardeners out here who have their own way of growing and planting, and I don't think there is a one particular right way or wrong way, but I plan to discuss with you this afternoon some of the things that I've gleaned over the last four years, and hopefully somebody can benefit from some of those. In addition to the techniques and tips and so on that I get from gardening. There's some other really side 
benefits that I've experienced by being out here. I just find that coming out to the garden uh, on a regular basis over the summer is very calming to me. It's uh, actually therapeutic. I could even consider it a form of meditation. You're out here, you're working in the soil, you're enjoying yourself. It can be a solitary activity, or if you want, you have lots of other people you can exchange ideas with. The other thing I like about the garden is that we give at least 20% of what we grow to the food banks, the local food banks. And uh, that amounts to literally thousands of pounds of produce that are contributed each year. And that's a great part of what we, we do out here. So um, I'm going to start by talking about the layout of my garden and how I try to organize it. I've recently... Uh, we've recently put in this new box around the perimeter. Each of the gardens, most of them are five feet wide by, or rather six feet wide by 25 feet long. And uh, most of us do like to put these boxes around the garden for a number of reasons. One of the things that it helps me to do is to help level it somewhat and to keep water from draining off and helps the water to drop down into the soil where it needs to be. The other thing I do with my garden, <coughs> the box, is that it uh, allows me to section it off. I section it off in horizontal sections, and I use these vertical trellises that I've built to help me section it. So in this case, what I've done is I've just taken some poles, put them into the soil. I then put these hollow PVC pipes uh, around to make this rectangle, and then I put these wire field fence uh, fences on there to make the trellis. So that enables me to do some horizontal gardening by section, and enables me to do some vertical gardening with these trellises. People use all kinds of different trellises out here, vertical support systems. There are lots of good ones. This just happens to be the one example that I use. <laughs> So when I'm talking about putting together my spring garden, my early spring garden coming up here in a couple of weeks, uh, the first thing I have to think about is what's going to grow, what's going to be frost resistant. So that's uh, that kind of information, if you're a new gardener, is available. Uh, this, there's staff out here that can help you decide what's a good thing to plant early spring, what's not a good thing to, good thing to plant during that time. We also, I think, have some informational sheets around that can tell you when uh, to plant certain plants. So I'll begin by planting my frost resistant ones in certain sections. I probably, for example, will put my sugar beets in this section starting in a couple of weeks. And uh, maybe later in the summer, in this section, I would plant some tomatoes and so on. One of the things that I can keep track of if I section it off this way is that I can remember what plants I put where. So if I put beets here this year, I don't want to keep putting my beets in the same spot every year, year after year. And the reason for that is that I don't ever have an opportunity to let my garden go fallow for a whole year. And so certain nutrients tend to get used up during the year, and a particular nutrients, depending on the plant, will get used more and more. So I try to rotate my crops each year from section to, se to section. Uh, the other thing that I will do by section is I'll do what we call succession planting. So I'll plant my beet seeds here in the next couple of weeks. They'll begin to grow, and I'll probably harvest my beets uh, sometime in mid to late May. And by that time, let's say instead of uh, after I take the beets out, then I'll put my transplants of my hatch green chilies in here, and they'll continue to grow. And by the end of uh, the summer, I'll have a nice harvest of, uh, of green chilies. And I'll do the same thing with the other sections of the garden, do succession planting, depending on what I want to grow, where and when. One other advantage of doing this in sections is that I can look, think about the watering needs of a particular crop. So if I put beets in here, 
these are going to be a relatively dense crop. They'll be planted relatively close together, so uh, they might benefit by me putting in uh, some kind of a soaker hose that would water along those rows. Whereas if I plant, I said I was going to put tomatoes over here a little bit later in the summer, those tomatoes, of course, are going to be bigger plants and they'll be further apart. So I might, instead of planting in rows, I might plant them on mounds and I might make a circular trench around them for purposes of watering. And instead of using a soaker hose, I might run a drip system along here and use emitters that would be at the base of every single plant, making more efficient water use and getting more watering to the bottom of those tomato plants. Well, back here, I have a uh, setup that we call a manifold, and I won't, there'll be a, another class on our different kinds of watering systems, but just to point out to you that this particular manifold has valves that I could attach four different hoses to for watering. And then I have a, a lead hose here, which will attach to this yellow spigot. Each garden has this yellow spigot that can be utilized as an auto watering system later in the summer. So I could take one of these valves and use that for a soaker hose that would come along here and would water my beets. And then I could take another valve and I could run it into this section and that would be used for uh, taking care of my tomatoes, for example, later in the season. So sectioning off horizontally and now vertically in the spring, I'll plant my sugar snap peas at the bottom of that trellis uh, here in a couple of weeks. They're frost resistant and they'll continue to grow up this trellis here and they'll vine like they like to do up here. And in the middle of May, they'll start to flower and eventually I'll start to get some nice, hopefully some nice sugar snap peas out of that. About the time they're ready to come off, I will plant my pole beans or my green beans where I had the sugar snap peas before. And those beans will come up and by mid to late summer, I'll have a nice green bean crop. So I can make more efficient use out of my space by doing some crops horizontally in sections, and other crops I can do vertically along these trellises. You'll also notice that I've got some straw mulch here that I have over the surface of my soil. And I put that, so that straw in there last fall, late fall, after I had finished with all of my fall crops. So that was around the end of October. And what this straw accomplishes, it's, it serves as what we call an organic mulch. There are several types of organic mulches, uh, could be wood chips, could be pine needles, could be bark. But I like this straw because uh, it, is, it is broken down relatively easily. So I can eventually use that not only as a cover, but also as a compost. And how it serves as a cover, it insulates the soil like oh, in, during the winter. It will insulate the soil underneath to keep the soil relatively warm, and it will also hold moisture. So what I did as an experiment this last fall is I planted some garlic uh, cloves down into my soil, and you can see a few of them starting to come up. Hopefully I'm gonna have a garlic crop uh, later this spring and early summer, and uh, hopefully that was facilitated by putting that layer of straw mulch down before the winter came along. The other thing about mulches, especially straw mulch, as I said, it can actually be used as a compost. I, I will turn this into the soil along with my other amendments. And the benefit that I get out of that is that it breaks down the nutrients that are in there. It's a carbon rich material. So lots of carbon will end up down in the soil, which is important for various activities in the soil, including water retention and helping to retain the minerals in the soil, things such as that. And it releases other nutrients as well. So now I have my garden kind of laid out like I want it. I have it horizontally and vertically arranged. I've thought through the process of what I'm gonna plant in each section and when I'm going to plant each of those crops 
in that section and exactly where I'm going to position those. And now we're coming up on the spring growing season. So I have got to get my soil all ready the way I like it before I start planting. And I like to plant, try to achieve a goal that's called a loamy soil. And by loamy, we mean that it's got uh, kind of equal parts of sand or granite. It's got clay in there. And then it's got silt, and it's got about 25% or more of what we call uh, organic material. So that's what I'm going to try to achieve by adding these different amendments. Um, uh, what I mean by organic material is really anything that's decomposing vegetative biologic material. Uh, that comes in the form of compost. It could come in the form of mulch. Uh, I've got some manure here that I'm going to talk about. There are ba various forms of organic material that I can use that will end up giving me a nice type of composted soil that uh, has all the characteristics that I want. Many of those characteristics are that it's going to be rich in elemental nutrients like carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. It's going to have lots of beneficial microbes, literally billions of those in there, that are going to go through the soil and the components, uh, the organic materials in there, and it's going to break them down from their bound state into an elemental state that would then be available for the plants as nutrients. And so what I try to end up with is a soil that is kind of light in texture, has a good structure to it, and it's it's uh, aerated soil. By that I mean it's able to uh, hold water, and yet it's able to drain water well, and it's got all that rich organic material also in there. So how do I achieve that goal? Well, starting with the last fall, one of the things I like to do is I like to add these um, alfalfa pellets. And I will go and I will find a place where I can get about a 40 pound bag of those. And uh, I will spread those after the end of my summer garden across the surface of my garden. And then I will just turn those into the soil about eight or 10 inches using a shovel or a tiller or, or whatnot. The benefit of those alfalfa pellets is that they're rich in nitrogen. And what they're going to do is they're going to slowly release locked up nitrogen into the soil because nitrogen is one of those nutrients that really gets consumed by the plants each year. So I want to make sure that I have plenty of nitrogen. Before I decide, a lot of times before I decide on what I'm going to add to the soil, I might do this test here or a test like this. It's called a rapid test. I'm not going to actually demonstrate the test today. It's a very simple thing that can be done. You simply put some of your soil along with the capsules and the water in each one of these little, these little uh, test tubes. And what they end up measuring for you is the adequacy of your nitrogen and your phosphorus and your potassium in the soil. Those are the three key nutritional elements that you need to make sure you have along with many other minor elements, and it also measures the pH of your soil. Uh, you, we want a soil for vegetable gardening to be roughly in the 6.0 to 7.0 range. Most of our gardeners out here, I think, have found that their, their soil is in that range, so they don't necessarily have to do a lot to it, but there are products that you can re reduce the pH or raise the pH, make it more alkaline or more acidic if you have a particular type of vegetable perhaps that wants a more acidic soil such as for example sweet potatoes they like a relatively acidic soil you can add sulfur to your soil but it takes weeks if not months sometimes even years to significantly lower your ph using that type of additive you can add lime to your soil to raise the ph but again that takes a long time but uh, the point here is that if you decide that you want to do some testing of your soil before you amend it to see how much you need. That's probably not a bad idea. 
I have done the test like this almost every year, I think, since I've been here. And I don't think there's been a single circumstance where I've had too much nitrogen or too much potassium or, or too much phosphorus. I'm always, if anything, I'm deficient. <clears throat> so uh, I want to add this organic material to uh, my soil to make it rich. And how do I do that? Well, the amendments that I'm going to talk about today that I usually like to add, there's actually four different things that I'll, I'll end up doing to this soil, this garden, over the next few weeks before I begin to plant. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to add compost. And uh, compost, uh, really what compost is, is it's, it's decaying vegetation of various sorts. It's uh, decaying uh, uh, leaves, uh, veg vegetables even, uh, plants, even fruits. Uh, some people do their own composting at home. Uh, they make piles of this de uh, decaying and uh, used up material and or they put it in a bin and they add water to it and they make sure it gets air. And over the period of several months, you'll end up with a nice compost. Well, what is that compost? Again, it's all those nutrients that are tied up in that vegetation that are let loose as the microbes in that compost go to work. And over time, by the time you get a nice aged compost, uh, whether you make it yourself or you buy it commercially, uh, that uh, really en enriches the soil. Now, these amendments that I get, uh, I particularly like the ones, be these uh, from uh, our local plant fair nursery, uh, because I know that they're going to be organic, 100% organic in nature. Uh, I think I said earlier, if I didn't, just to make sure that everybody knows, we are 100% organic out here at the Payson Community Garden. We don't use any synthetic uh, fertilizers, uh, any synthetic uh, herbicides or insecticides. Uh, we use no GMO products. So you can feel good that when you're producing a product by the end of the season, you've got a 100% healthy product. So I get these uh, com organic composted uh, chicken manure here, and I would probably use about a bag of this on an entire garden such as this one. So I'll just spread some of this out here now. And again, this has got the compost in it. It's also got seasoned manure, chicken manure. And by the way, when it comes to manure, you need to make sure that we use vegetative uh, or uh, herbivore type manure uh, that comes from say cows or horses or chickens cheap. Uh, that's what you want uh, when you get the, the manure. And this will be a seasoned manure that comes in here, and I'll talk a little bit about more, more about seasoning manure in a second. So I've got my compost chicken manure here. I've got my composted mulch. And again, I, I talked about what the uh, benefits of uh, both compost and mulch are, and how those break down into the soil over time. And I'll be spreading, I would spread those two over the whole surface. And then the third thing I have here is I have a wheelbarrow full of horse manure that's available from the back of our garden. And the gardeners here are all have access to this and you can pretty much use what you want. But I usually use about two wheelbarrows of this in the spring to each of my garden plots. And I just spread it over there along with the rest of the stuff that I've already put in there. Now it's important that we use what we call seasoned manure. Hot manure is fresh manure. And the problem with hot fresh manure is that it doesn't have its nitrogen bound up. So what it's going to do is release a whole lot of nitrogen too quickly, and it could burn the plant. The other thing about hot manure is that it could contain pathogenic uh, enteric bacteria, such as E. coli, uh, that you don't want there in our garden. So uh, we have seasoned manure, which is usually 
had an opportunity to sit out for three or four months or longer, and that's what we call uh, seasoned manure. The benefit of the manure is not only does it add compost and uh, and various nutrients, but it is also very uh, nitrogen rich. It also has microbes in it that help us to work and aerate the soil. So I've got my two forms of packaged compost here. I've got manure. And you know, I'll also take a little bit of this straw mulch that I had left over from the uh, winter layer I put in, and I'll just spread that over with this other. So I've actually got four different things in here. I've got my manure, I've got my straw, I've got my composted manure, and I've got my composted mulch. And then if I were doing my whole garden, I would just use a shovel or a pitchfork, whatever you want, and I would turn that over about eight to 10 inches and go through the whole garden this way. And once I've got all these elements in there, I turn it over and I'm just going to rake it out. I'll rake it after I turn it, smooth out my garden, and at that point, I'm ready to plant. That's it. So now I hopefully have my garden all laid out the way I want it. I've went, gone ahead and put my various amendments in here, which gets me ready for planting. So what I want to think about next is uh, exactly what I want to plant early, uh, because our early spring garden is coming upon us here in the next couple of weeks, and where I want to plant those particular products. Uh, so. For example, uh, what we're going to be planting early, as I've mentioned earlier, is anything that's frost resistant. My sugar beets will do well planting early. My sugar snap peas, they'll do well. Uh, my onions will do great planting them early. My garlic will do great. That's frost resistant. Uh, we have lettuce and spinach and carrots. Those all do pretty well in early spring. So think about what you like for your table at the end of the year. Don't plant anything that you don't want to eat necessarily. And uh, then decide where you want to put that in your garden. As far as to how you plant those, well, I don't know if there's any hard and fast rule about how to plant seeds and seedlings. I think everybody probably has their own idea. There are probably as many different ideas as there are gardeners out here. Some people plant in rows, others don't. Some people use mounds. Uh, there's various techniques and all of them seem to work to one extent or another. The most important thing, especially when it comes to planting seeds, is just to follow the packaged instructions. If you're planting beets, follow the instructions on how deep to plant those seeds, uh, how far apart to space them. You probably still have to do some thinning. In some cases, it's, sometimes it's a little bit better to plant too much than too little, and then you can always do some thinning later. Uh, onion sets, for example, uh, I bought my onion sets down at the plant fair recently and it came with a set of instructions on exactly what's the right thing to do to get those ready to plant and how deep to plant them and so on. So here is just a little bit of an example. I have built, I have uh, made a couple of trenches here and those are about 12 to maybe Try to make those 12 to 16 inches apart. And uh, then between the trenches, I have this elevated level area, and that's where I'm going to put my seeds. So my seeds would go in here according to whatever the instructions are. Uh, once I've got them planted, of course, then they need to be moistened right away, and they need to be watered pretty regularly, usually every day, to keep the, you want shallow moisture until those seeds germinate. Starting as soon as those seedlings start to come up, and whether that's after a week or 10 days, however long it takes for those seeds to become seedlings, that's when I want to do some post-planting fertilizer. 
which is in addition to the amendments I've already done to the soil. And again, it's extremely important in our garden to make sure that we use all organic products, no synthetics, no additives. So we try to use an all organic product. And there are just a plethora, not only of composted commercial products available, but uh, with fertilizers. So I'm just gonna give you an example of the fertilizer mix that I happen to like, and many of the other gardeners out here do as well. So it consists of four different things. Uh, the first one here is this, uh, this high yield blood mill, and it's a 2.75 pound bag. And I'll pour that in this bucket. And the function of this blood mill is that it's rich in nitrogen. And of course, uh, the nitrogen is important to the above ground portion of the plant. Uh, it helps the plant get nice deep color, develop its foliage, and all like that. Uh, the next one is this four pound bag of um, bone meal. So I'll put that whole bag in here. And the importance of the bone meal is that it's rich in phosphorus. And phosphorus is important for root growth and root de development uh, as the plant starts to grow. And then I've got this uh, myriad of potash, which is a source of potassium. So I'll add a smaller amount of this potassium to the mix. I'll put in about a cup of that. Add that into that mix. And potassium gives the plant hardiness. It helps it be resistant to different kinds of disease. And then the last component is going to be this organic G and B tomato, vegetable, and herb fertilizer. It has a, a combination of, of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. But the really important thing here is that it's just packed full of these beneficial soil uh, microbes. So I'll put that whole bag in here. And again, the critical importance of the microbes is that they begin to break down in the soil. They break down all these various nutrients into elemental nutrients that can be then used by the plant. Also, the microbes, along with your earthworms, beneficial earthworms that are in the soil, will help to aerate the soil so that it retains moisture. Then I'll probably just take this trial and mix all this up. It takes a while to get all this mixed together. And now, imagine if you can that We've got little seedlings coming up here on this little mesa. And down in the trench is where I want to sprinkle this mixture. And I'll put about, depending on how close together, how dense my crops are, I might put a quarter of a cup on each side of that plant. And if uh, it didn't do that, then I could just simply mix maybe a cup about every six to eight uh, linear feet. And once I've got that done, then I sprinkle some water over it to help it dissolve and absorb in. And I will do that fertilizer treatment about once a week until my plants reach full color and almost full maturity. And at that point then I would probably cut them back doing the fertilizing about uh, once a month. So I've planted, I've fertilized, and now what I'm doing is watching my plants grow, hopefully. Uh, and that's when the really the important 
and the fun stuff starts. That's when I try to be out here on a regular basis to uh, watch my plants grow. <laughs> uh, I also like to make sure that they're getting the appropriate amount of water. I check the foliage to see if it looks like they're getting too much or not enough water, too much or not enough fertilizer. Uh, it's important to weed your garden, to thin them out, uh, just in general to nurture your garden. I try to be out here on a regular basis. Of course, to me, it's not work uh, because I enjoy out, being out here so much. So, but that's an important component, just being here uh, as your garden continues on through the summer. And then hopefully at the end of the summer or in fall, whatever crop you put in, maybe the middle of the summer, you get to enjoy the benefits of of what you have started and what you worked so hard to grow. I call that the seed to table benefit. You get to take it home and uh, it ends up uh, on your dinner table or it ends up with your family or your friends. Uh, as I said before, at least 20% of what we grow um, ends up uh, at the food bank. And that's a big part of what we do out here. But it's all natural. It's all organic. It's great food. And then on top of all that, in my particular case, my wife loves to preserve and can. So much of what we grow, we end up canning. She ends up canning. We can pickles, uh, bottled pickles. She does beets. She even does tomatoes. Um, we do, we grow the green, uh, hatch green chilies in the garden and we have a, we dry those and, or rather we roast those after we pull them and we, use those to make a salsa and that gets canned. Uh, she even cans our rhubarb into jam. And then if we've got the benefits of the garden even over the winter, in addition to what we grow in the summer. So uh, I hope uh, what I've done here is gonna be a benefit to someone. Maybe you've learned a little bit about some of the ways that I do things. All right, good work there, Dan. And as this says, next week we'll have Carol Noble back to talk about vertical gardening. And this is the low tech vertical gardening like we do as gardeners, not that indoor artificial growth vertical gardening, which is kind of a big deal too, but <laughs> um, great work there, Dan. These videos are really coming together, had some good sound and activities and things like that. Um, got lots of questions coming in here. And so that's, uh, you're, you're always feeding your, your plants with that, uh, that fertilizer mix you talked about, just creating rows in between them and give them a little extra fertilizer throughout the, throughout the growing season. Yep. yep. And, and it works through through it that that quickly, you know. I mean, just keeping it nice and rich. Yeah, I think it's the, important to start out with a rich soil, and uh, you know, as you get into especially the middle end of summer, uh, that soil is going to start getting depleted of those nutrients. So it's important to keep the fertilizer going. That's that's good. You know, our soils are just so poor here. We have to create our own, own soils and give those plants what they need. So great tips, good stuff. Um, I'm going to get into our questions and answers here. Um, did have one more thing. Uh, you've got an open house going on next Saturday and people can come and visit the garden. Is that correct? We were talking at the beginning. That's correct. As far as I know, we might, if we have any staff on the on, they might put their comments in there. Maybe they know a little more than I do, but I'm pretty sure we're inviting the public out there this Saturday. Great. And I just also want to share that um, our Globe Miami Farmers Market down in the other half of the county on April 3rd, the following week, will be doing a plant sale. So they'll have lots of vegetable starts. If people wanted to come out to downtown Globe, we've got kind of the city hall, what we call our train park. Um, they should be out there and just have lots of vegetable starts for people. So just wanted to put in a little quick plug for that too. Um, so Donna had asked, she or mentioned, she, she's planted seeds following all the webinar directions 10 days ago. Uh -oh. Only seven of the 54 seeds have germinated. 
what's wrong. So um, you weren't part of that germination talk, were you? Me? Yeah. No. Uh, so Donna, depending on what types of seeds that you planted, um, they can take longer than seven or 10 days to come up. You know, if you're doing peppers and, and, and tomatoes, they can take up to three weeks. So just keep them warm, keep them moist, and just be patient. Does that sound about right? Yeah, soil temperature and air temperature and moisture all have a, an impact on how quickly our seeds are gonna come up. Yeah, so, so just stick with it because some of those species really take a while to, to germinate. Don't give up on them. Don't give up. <laughs> All right. Barry is asking, what are the ingredients and volume that you use in your soil recipe? So I think early on you were talking about putting all your um, compost together for your soiling. So he just wanted to get a little more specifics on that. Uh, I don't think there's an exact recipe on that. I think uh, if there's questions in your mind about how much of what to use, doing that little rapid test soil thing is a good thing to start with. That'll tell you whether you've got depletions in nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium. But uh, in my experience, it's, it's hard to do too much. I, I mentioned, I think on the video that I, I put about a bag each of that composted chicken manure and the composted, um, the compost, mulch compost in there. But it doesn't hurt to add more and I've had situations where I might use more than two wheelbarrows of the seasoned manure in my garden as well and just get that all turned in. I might even do a little bit of it in the fall and do a little bit more in the spring. So um, making, making the soil rich with those different organic amendments, it's hard to overdo it. So true. And, and so, and, and with those tests that you do, do you really get, um, I mean, how's your potassium hold up? Does it really get depleted or like you're just, you only have to put a little bit in, like you say there, you only had a cup in your mix. There. Yeah, no, I, I don't have a severe, in my gardens, I don't have a severe problem with potassium deficiency. It's usually nitrogen that uh, right. I have to do the most with. And, and, and phosphorus holds up pretty well too. Yep. Good. Yeah. Our nitrogen, it just gets used up and goes to the air. It's really volatile. So um, let's see. And Barry asked, what are the sizes of the beds in this garden? And I know that they are six feet by 25 feet. And that was decided early. You know, six feet wide, you can pretty much get to the middle. But I think the plant, any, any comments you have on that? Uh, that's the size of most of the gardens. Some people have made double gardens. Uh, so they've rented two and expanded the box size and then created uh, walks or ways to get in to the expanded garden. We have a couple of rows of uh, raised gardens that uh, are helpful for handicapped people where they don't have to get down on their hands and knees. Those are smaller boxes. Uh, and there's a couple of rows of those up front. And, and back to that size, uh, the six feet is probably about as wide as you can reach to the middle. Maybe in five feet, a little bit easier, depending on how tall people are. Yeah. And the 25 foot length was for the minimum size they make those soaker hoses. Yep. So I think that was the main reason why that size was kind of ideal. Yeah. And what some people will do is when they divide their garden off horizontally into sections. They'll put uh, a plank uh, running across the garden that helps them access their garden a little bit easier. That's another way to get, get in there. Good. And okay, so, so Susan is now asking, can you plant garlic and onions together? I'm sure you can. So any comments on garlic and onion at the same time? They do fine together. I, I, I have used uh, onion as a perimeter crop because bugs tend to be repelled by onions and garlic. So not only can they be used together, they can be used uh, in conjunction with other crops to kind of repel pests as we get into the summer. 
And un unless you're growing those, you know, big sweet onions, a lot of times you're, you're going to harvest your onion before the garlic. Garlic takes a while to come to, to harvest, right? Yeah, I, well, it depends. I, I, I planted my, some garlic this time last fall. And I've got some nice garlic coming up now. So I'm hopeful that those will be ready fairly early on. Uh, both garlic and onion probably be both good plants to, plants for fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And Madeline is asking, is it helpful to add peat moss? Uh, I know there are some of our gardens. Uh, I haven't used peat moss, but Margaret is one of our staff members. And I saw her out there the other day putting a lot of peat moss in her and I was in hers and I was asking her about it. And I think that might serve as an excellent, uh, not only insulator, but a soil amendment. And peat moss is really good stuff. Uh, it, we have a lot of alternatives to it. it. It's important to know where you get peat from because some peat, peat fields, the, the peat bogs, they store peat and carbon that's hundreds and thousands of years old. And so they'll go in there, they'll mine, they'll mine those, but you know, it is a, a carbon storage source that can be used, they catch on fire. Lots of things are happening with peat bogs and peat marshes these days. So personally, I like to recommend all the alternatives, but you know, okay. it's certainly available and, and still, still excellent organic material. Um, Dick is asking any minerals, which ones amounts and from what? So yeah, so you've got several of those amendments you're putting in. We're still picking up the calcium, the, 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 the magnesium. Kind of thing, magnesium. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those minor micronutrients little, that we need. Little manganese in some of them. And those are those are critical. They just are required in smaller amounts. So it's good to look at the package to see if you're getting some of that in there. So you should be getting that in some of these prepared um, fertilizers that you're buying, the organic fertilizers. And again, watch what the plants are saying. The so plants will tell you if they are deficient in some of the, particularly iron or zinc, that'll, that'll show up on certain species and so. But that isn't typically an issue you guys run into, not enough minerals, I don't know. Is that right? I think that's correct. Yeah. Mineral deficiencies? Okay. So Jacob, Jacob is asking, what exactly do you, where exactly do you plant your starts? In the trench, trench or at the side of the trench? Uh, you know, I think there's probably as many ways to plant your seedlings as there are gardeners out there. Uh, I like to use the little elevated plateaus for uh, things such as my beets so that I don't, or my seeds uh, or my seedlings so that I, um, I'm careful not to, you know, wash them away when I'm watering. Um, I, I elevate uh, a little plateau and that's where I put my seeds and then I put a little trench along the side of it uh, for fertilizing and then wet that. I might also add, use my, uh, you saw the bucket that I had that works as a sprinkler as well uh, to keep the soil moist right around the base of the seed or where the seed is and right around the base of the little seedling. I might even sprinkle a little water directly there. Um, so it just depends on, you know, what your own flavor is. And I think it also depends on the, the, which species of plant you're working with, you know, because you don't want them to damp off and that water standing there, but others could use a little more water when it comes in. And, and this is a garden. You're going to be out there and you can be moving soil around a lot. Just keep your roots covered. So you get, keep, make sure those roots have access to water, just like. Dan said. And so Diana is asking, what alternatives to peat moss can you suggest? Um, everything that uh, Dan just mentioned, he's got composted manure, the chicken manure. Go, go through your, your products again that you're using. Well, I like this. I like the recipe, the combo that I have end up settling on, which is um, I use the seasoned horse manure from the back of our garden. I use uh, some co uh, composted mulch that I buy over at Plant Fair Organic. I buy um, composted manure. In this case, I use chicken manure, again, organic. 
and I'll even throw in a little mulch in there and just turn all that into the soil. And that makes a really nice, what we call a friable soil. When you pick it up, it's crumbly. It, uh, it means that it's gonna retain water, but it's also going to drain water well and it's gonna have all those nice nutrients as well as the really essential uh, microbes down in there. One other thing I'd mention about watering is, and I think I may have said this or not, but when you first plant seeds um, or seedlings, um, but particularly with seeds, it's important to have the soil wet down an inch or two. You can use a finger test or whatever you want, but it needs to be kept somewhat moist there pretty regularly. But then uh, when you get the, the seedlings going and the plants start to come up, um, then what you're looking for is less frequent watering and getting water down to a greater depth, down to say six inches. So that it encourages those roots to go further down into the ground. Yeah, and, and you want those soils to already be moist so that those roots have some place to go. And of course, that water wicks up as well, you know, cool the capillary action. So yeah, make sure it's moist. And it's, and it's easy not to be moist enough here when it's brand new, <laughs> we're so dry. And um, I'm going to go back to Diana's question about the peat moss. Um, I am sure that there are types of peat moss out there that are sustainably grown. So just read the, the label and just know what you're, what you're buying. Okay, so Don, Donna is asking, I have used the small diameter soaker ho hose, the drip size, sorry. Okay, small diameter soaker, drip size hose along each row and it clogs up with minerals. And I have to replace it several times a year. So what's your solution? Uh, I don't know if there's a good solution for that. I'm not sure exactly what diameter circle ho uh, soaker hose she's referring to. I know they, they sell those little quarter inch round soaker hoses that look like um, the emitter hoses, but they have little tiny pinprick holes in them that are, can be used as soakers. And I've noticed that quite a few people have used those. And I think because of the smaller diameter of those and because of the kind of the hard nature of our water, you're gonna get quite a bit of calcium buildup and those are gonna to tend to plug up. But even with the larger diameter soaker hoses that I use, um, I'm good for maybe a year or two of those. And then because of that issue, I have to replace them. I don't know it, if there's a solution to that. I, I know people have tried putting vinegar water in there and flushing them out. That might help, but uh, it's, a, it's a project. Yeah, and, and just like you said, they don't last long. And so how do you keep that, those minerals in solution? You can keep it from drying out, but it still dries out in between boring. So it's, it's kind of a struggle with that. So keep, look at different brands, Stay away from the very fine emitters, and maybe that'll help out. But yeah, it's it's a constant project. Some people there they have the flat soaker hoses, and then they have the round soaker hoses. And uh, some people believe that the round ones um, don't last quite as long as the flat ones. But also, you get other people that think vice versa. So that those soaker hoses and the problems with those. Uh, is one good reason to try to use um, irrigation type tubing with the small emitter uh, hoses uh, with the emitter on the end. They tend to clog up less and probably last a little bit longer. And of course, also you're targeting individual plants with that type of setup. Very good. Um, just taking a glance over to our chat box, Susan Jid come in about the uh, the welcome to the garden party is from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday, March 20. Public welcome, garden opens at 10 a.m. So people can head over from there. And uh, you can get Glenn's Magic Formula, get the recipe from plantfairnursery.com. So that's what Dan put together was that magic formula, which he uses to fertilize his vegetables throughout the season. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess I failed to mention that's what we call it. You might have seen that five gallon bucket I had in the video. You probably couldn't it's see it. It's an angle, yeah. It's, it's labeled Glenn's Magic. And so it, it is. So that, 
that combo that I put in there. Uh, I like it because uh, it's been tried and tested and proven. It's organic. Um, and uh, yeah, we get that at Plant Fair. And that it uses that blood meal, which is a real mild form of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So one concern I was going to have if you're adding that nitrogen on so frequently, whether you might be burning your roots or, you know, some of that nitrogen burn. But that's a good point. That's actually yeah. why I like to put the fertilizer down into a little furrow instead of directly on or around the plant. I think it's less likely to burn it that way, but that's just my preference. It's some, yeah, something to watch out for. And when you do get into some nitrogen burn, it does slow that plant down. They can fail too, but they got to get their, get back into balance and grow, growing correctly. Um, I'm getting a couple of questions about mushroom mulch and mushroom compost. Do you have any comments on that and awareness of using um, mushroom mulch? Sorry, never tried it. You know, um, Dick and Linda, that's new to me. So um, we may have some of our other gardeners to share with that and put it into my uh, evaluation as perhaps an idea to talk about. I've got Stephanie saying that her plants love the mushroom compost. So maybe I can even get Glenn on again to talk about that mushroom compost, but I, it's new to me. So good, sounds, sounds like good stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kath, Kathleen, Catherine says, um, some people use peat moss because it helps hold water in the soil. In place of that, try coconut coir. It helps keep soil moist. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate your adding that information. And Judith is asking, is it still beneficial to add alfalfa at this time of year, at this time of year um, in Flagstaff? I, I think it's too cold to be adding that. But anyway, you tell me. I can't comment on Flagstaff. I think it's what, 7,000 feet or higher? It's a couple thousand feet higher. Yeah. But my rule of thumb is as soon as the soil is not frozen down in far enough to dig and turn it, then it's okay to start adding amendments. And I will add the alfalfa pellets in the fall, but I often use it also in the spring along with my other amendments. So it, is, it isn't necessarily something you're adding through the growing season as a source of nitrogen or, 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 or yeah, when do you apply your alfalfa? I apply it either at the end of the year or at the beginning of the year. The reason I like the fall is because it, it, is, it does come in pellets and it needs to dissolve in order to you know, access the nitrogen. So by doing it in the fall, it gives me, it gives the soil a chance and water and rain a chance to dissolve that alfalfa. Uh, what, what I sometimes will do in the fall is just pour it over the surface and just leave it there. And then in the spring, mm -hmm. it'll still be setting there, but in a dissolved state, and I'll turn it in with the rest of my amendments. All right. I'll, I'll, good, good product, good stuff. And yeah, so that was Judas thing. So, so we're using it like a compost, just what you described to me. Yep. It needs to break down, it needs to be part of the compost. Yep. All right, we have gone through our people's questions. They have really hung on through the whole presentation here. So that is super. If we got a few more questions, we can bring them on. Otherwise, I'm going to bring up those last slides and we're going to call it what we're done for the day. This has been great, Dan. Oh, Dan, quickly, look at those beets. You, you were showing us some of the pictures on, those, on the, in the video of some of your canned beets. Those are my beets that I usually harvest in late May. And you get those planted when? Right now, early March, mid-March. So in just a matter of a couple of months, you've got a beautiful yep. beet, super. Yep. And do you eat those beet greens and so on too? Yeah, beet greens are best when the plant is still young. You can trim them and eat the greens and it'll continue to grow. It gets a little bitter as the plant gets bigger. Good, good in an egg frittata, aren't they? 
<laughs> you bet. Yeah. All right. So there's Dan again. We've just had our question and answer. And before I get too much further, I'm going to make sure people have that evaluation handy. Because I don't, I do appreciate people filling that out for me. go come on yeah so please look at that chat box open up that link for the webinar for the for the uh, evaluation take you about two minutes and really helps me out a lot and here's our closing slide uh, we are doing the pace community gardens spring gardening class series um, you can find the schedule here at extension.arizona.edu slash gila uh, the best cell face cell uh, a fail fail safe. Uh, how about that for not even being able to say fail safe? Um, is that calendar function at that at my website there? And um, when you can find that there, it's usually about there for the week or a few weeks out. And use that link. Each one of these have a, has a un unique link. And our next webinar is next Thursday, March twenty fifth at eleven a.m. We have Carol Noble, some, a new face, and we'll be talking about vertical gardening. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. All right, so let's stop this recording. <laughs>